Good. So let's start our lecture four. So last week in our teaching history, we talked about international trade, right? So today we will talk about economic integration, okay? Which means countries they try to integrate to increase trade. All right. Last week when we talked about international trade, we said that international trade is so good. Yes? If it practiced based on comparative advantages and absolute advantages, then nations will, will benefit, right? But in reality, in reality, it is not practiced 100%. Okay? It is not practiced 100%. Why? Because of protectionism policy of each country. So now, for example, Uzbekistan knows, our country, we know that Chinese, they have absolute advantage in terms of production of something. Russians, they have comparative advantage you know, in terms of production in other goods, all right? But still, we are imposing tariffs. We know that if we buy from them, it will be cheaper for us. But we are putting barriers intentionally, okay? Why? Because we want our domestic industry to get mature too. If we don't protect our infant industries today, it means that for the rest of our life, or for centuries, our grandparents, they will be dependent on Chinese and Russian goods, okay? So if you are able to develop now, then it's good for us. Anyway, because of those, you know, tariffs, you know, and then quotas based on trade, okay, some countries, they try to come closer with each other, and they try to economically integrate to increase trade between the countries and remove those barriers, okay? So if, if someone asks you what is integration, it's very broad meaning for us for if you apply to the world. For example, they have social integration, okay? We know what social integration is, which means we do not discriminate people based on their color, yes? Based on their beliefs which ethnic group they belong to. So what is the benefit? If in a country that social integration is well established, okay, it means that people are united, okay, and you not unity. If people are united, it is very good for the economy because they will be trying to do their best all together. Actually, in the previous like. Uh, lecture today in the morning one student asked what about the United States? There is high level of discrimination but they are the most developed country. You know that's right. It might be it might be one exception, but United States I believe would be even more developed if there wasn't that discrimination. Okay? You know that there are some groups you know they don't want to work. Okay? So if they were even more united they could be even greater. One possible answer. Okay. And then another one, very important integration is political integration. You know that pro-American countries, pro-Russian countries, pro-Chinese, yes? So what does it mean pro? Because their political interests are same. Okay? So those countries with slow political integration, I mean the interest, they try to make blocks. Okay? Blocks. You ask? or Soviet Union, those blocks, okay? Good? And then we have economic integration. Economic integration. Economic integration will not exist unless first that political integration is established, okay? Country, they agree to establish economic integration, they trade with one another once their political views are same, same and they support each other, okay? Good. So what is uh, economic integration? So economic integration, when group of countries, they agree to reduce or eliminate barriers for trade, okay? And they try to make the economy similar to theirs, based on monetary policy, okay, it depends on the level, okay, and this will follow. So this is economic integration, okay? And what is the purpose of economic integration? Why? to those countries, you know, they establish economic integration. Number one, it is good for people, okay? For people. Once we are, you know, trading without any trade barriers, we will have more access for variety of goods, and it will cost much cheaper for us to buy, because there is competition. 
And of course, at the same time, it is good for consumers. Okay? If with trading partner, they are, they are supplying us with raw materials, before integration, they were buying it with high cost because of tariff. Now we are able to buy, producers are able to buy. Without tariff, it is good for producers. Why? They are able to reduce their cost and they are able to sell more. Not only locally, but to neighboring countries too, integrated nations. Okay? And all of this is done for the sake of improving international trade. Okay? Good. And there is a theory of trade blocks trade blocks, which is economic integration. So which means, according to trade blocks, we can you know, distinguish countries into two groups, member countries and non-member countries. All right? Member countries, you know, their political views are same, they are economically integrated. Within those countries, they reduce or remove barriers, trade barriers, okay? Or they make it very low or just eliminate. While they will hold, you know, while they will hold high tariffs for non-members, okay? It is called theory of trade blocks, okay? They are areas, good? So now I will explain you that economic integration levels, okay? So it starts, you know, with the weakest type of economic integration and it reaches the strongest type of economic integration. The first is preferential trading arrangement. Okay? So now I will try to explain it on the board with an example. For example, let's suppose, what is preferential trading arrangement? So which means once countries, they sign a trade agreement, okay, and they agree to integrate, so they will agree, agree to lower their tariffs between each other. So let's suppose our neighboring country, Kazakhstan, and our country, Uzbekistan, Okay. And there is another kind of country, for example, China. China. Let's say Kazakhstan buys cotton from us, and we buy wheat from Kazakhstanis. Okay. So because in Uzbekistan we have also, you know, our agriculture is quite developed. We also, our farmers, they also produce wheat, yes? Which means, let's suppose that in order to protect our wheat producing farmers, we impose tariffs on Kazakhs, Kazakh wheat, okay? Let's suppose 20%. It is Uzbekistan tariffs imposed on wheat. There is another supplier from China, okay? Which is also able to supply that we and they are we know the imposed by 10 to 20 percent of tariffs. Okay? It's clear. It's up to us whether we want to buy from Kazakhstan or China. For example, Kazakhstanis, on the other hand, if they want to buy because we impose tariffs, for example, on their wheat, they will definitely impose tariffs on our cut one reason, okay? Let's say 10 percent tariff a bit low but because they are more dependent on our cut. And there is another supply in China, okay, which is also able to supply. So Kazakhstan, they also impose tariffs on their cut. I think regarding this one is clear, right? But now, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, these two countries, they agreed to sign preferential trading arrangement. They want to integrate economically, okay? Which means, if they sign that agreement, they will agree to reduce tariffs. Let's suppose, you know, but here with Pakistan, dear Kazakhs, you know, we really like your wheat and we really like your cotton. So, to support our economy, it's the, you know, reason why establishing, why don't we reduce tariffs? So, both sides will benefit. Okay. So, why don't we reduce to 50%? Good. So now, from 10%, they will reduce 5%. Kazakhstan, and from, from 20 we, we reduce to 10 percent. It depends, totally depends on the agreement. They can reduce it to 90 percent, no problem. Okay, yeah, I'm saying the 50 percent. Good. So now, as a result of economic integration, these two countries, they reduce tariffs, and they are buying cheaper from each other. While we are 
if, if, if they want to buy, if we want to buy from China, it's still 20%. We reduce with one, only our member countries. Okay, good. Another thing is, at this point, we reduce by our Uzbekistan's, for example, the external tariff for other countries is, is different from Kazakhstan. Okay? We have our own tariff policy, they have their own tariff policy. This is the first case of integration, first level. So if you consider all countries in the world, you will definitely find all countries they have preferential trading arrangement with some countries. Okay? Uzbekistan, we have this, Russia, with Kazakhstan, we have it too. Okay. Good. So second level of integration is free trade area. Okay? Free trade area. It's the second, which means more advanced level of integration. The best example is NAFTA, which you have heard, okay? Those three countries, United States, Canada, and Mexico, in, nine, in January 1991, they signed that free trade area agreement. North America free trade area, okay? What's the purpose of, of that establishment? Let's, again, we consider this example. And now, instead of China, let's change it to Russia, okay? Let's suppose we are not with Russia, not integrated, let's suppose, okay? So now, We are integrated with Kazakhstan, preferential trading arrangement, okay? So now, we want to make it free trade area. We see that after establishing uh, the preferential trading arrangement, Uzbekistan's economy and Kazakhstan's economy significantly changing to positive because of the benefit, okay? So now they... You know, uh, Mr. Uzbekis, Mr. Kazakis, now we really benefit as you witness. Why don't we integrate even further? Because they are benefiting. They will agree that to establish FTA, free trade area. According to FTA, these, these are countries, they will agree to eliminate tariffs. Okay, now tariffs is zero percent for both sides. Okay? For both sides. While Uzbekistan's tariff policy is different from Kazakhstan. For example, let's suppose Russian food, okay? Of which we buy and Kazakhstan is also buy. Compared to Kazakhstan, for example, in Uzbekistan we have more goods, okay, let's suppose. And we also, let's suppose, we produce food. Because of that one, we impose 20% tariffs on Russian goods. Why Kazakhstan may with the desert area and less food because they need more, so they impose only 10% tariff on Russian food. Is it different? Same, right? So now our tariff between between the countries, no tariff or no I mean restrictions on trade, but our external tariffs is different, even though it's the same good. Okay? There is one disadvantage of such kind of trading, all right, unless it is clearly mentioned in the document. Why? What kind of problem it may cause? For example, you can see. Now, Russians, if they want to sell it to Uzbekistan, their food, it will cost 20% tariff, right? It's more expensive. There is another way of trading Uzbekistan through Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. So they will export it to Kazakhstan. Okay? After that, my Kazakhstan one businessman, the dealer, can sell to Uzbekistan without any tariffs. Okay? It is one disadvantage of such kind of agreement. For example, in the case of NAFTA, these three countries, you know, very, very rich and very smart countries in terms of trade. Document that agreement, I think it's more than 2,000 page document. Okay? More than 2,000 page document, which indicate everything. All right? Because US is very great economy, big market, and Canada too. And you know, there are so many goods and services that can be exported to Mexico, okay, with low tariffs, that can be sold to these countries. 
So therefore, while signing the document, Americans and Canadians, they make it perfectly clear. It must be Mexican origin. Do you understand? If it's, you know, even though it comes through this border, but its origin is China or Uzbekistan, they will say, no, it's, we still impose same tax. It means double tax. All right? So therefore, in the document, it should be clearly explained. All right? Good. So this is free trade area, okay? So which means no tariffs between the country, but different external tariffs. Okay. Then we have customs union, all right? It's the third level of economic integration, which means higher integration. So now, according to customs union, in addition to making our tariffs equal to zero between these integrated countries, our external tariffs should be also same. So we should make it now, it cannot be 10%, 20%, or 30%, 10%, okay? It should be same, 10%, 10% on other countries' goods, okay? On other countries' goods. For example, regarding this one, I think it's clear, no tariff plus common external tariffs. European Union, it used to be customs union, now it is already common market, okay? Even integrated. So, for example, Eurasia, the uh, customs union, these countries, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, it is one, we can consider a customs union, okay? And in some other Gulf countries, they also have customs union, which means they are practicing with that, this type of trade, okay? Good. But here, too, there is one disadvantage that may arise. For example, now, Let's consider here, instead of Kazakhstan, Russia. We economically integrated with Russia. Customs Union, we established, okay? And let's say here we have Germany, another third party, with, with whom we did not establish that economic integration. Let's suppose, before establishing Customs Union, okay? Russia and Uzbekistan, they established free trade area where Russian, you know, tariff for other countries is different, okay? And ours is different. If we want to buy German cars, which is less than $40,000, you know, that we impose 100% tariff, right? Let's suppose in Russia, in Russia, I don't know exactly, maybe it's 50%, okay? Different. So now, these two countries, they want to establish customs union, which means these both countries' external tariffs should be the same. Which means Uzbekistan is not willing to reduce its tariff to 50% because if we reduce, our GM will suffer. On the other hand, Russians, they don't want to increase their tariffs because it will cause public, you know, disagreement or, you know, it will make public angry. Because they, are, they want to buy foreign car, it will cost much higher. So now, in this case, these two countries, they should, you know, negotiate and they make it this kind of sensitive tariffs, same too. Maybe 75%, okay, or something else. It depends on the bargaining power of each party. All right? Good. So they have to give it one. Then we have that fourth level of integration, which is called common market. European Union is a good example. Okay, European Union. So what is different of common market with customs union? So what? No tariffs between the countries. Wild trade. Their external tariffs is exactly the same. All member countries, same, let's say 75%, 75%, same. Plus, if common, common market agreement is signed, these countries, they will trade also based on factor of production, labor mobility and capital mobility. Do you understand? 
For example, if you can see that the European Union, which consists of 27 countries, right? 27 countries. So which means mobility of labor of these countries, member countries, is no problem anywhere. Estonian, people from Estonia can come to Germany and work if they have, you know, after, I mean, job vacancy available, no problem. Germans can, can go to France. Or Brit or, okay, British now is under question, right? Okay, so Italians, they can, labor mobility is no problem. And capital mobility too, okay, which is very important for production. For example, today, all countries, they have some limits of, for example, if you want to, if you have, let's say, $100,000 in your banking account today. If you go to the bank, can you get that money? You can, no problem. Okay, you can go and you can withdraw that money, $100,000, if you want to keep it at home, right? So let's say I got that money that I have in my bank and I want to go to Tajikistan. Am I able to get it outside? No, no. there is limit, right? Certain limit. So which means, if common market is established, moving your money here and there is no problem too. Okay, of course for some economic purpose. Good. And another advantage of common market is these countries they try to maintain fixed exchange rates. Why? There are 27 member countries. And what is their currency? Euro, right? So this euro, this this currency is only okay considered to be the national currency of 19 members. The rest eight countries they have different currencies. British has pound and some other have other currency. Okay. What's the benefit? Why did they make the fixed exchange rate? because to avoid any negative impacts. For example, if these 19 countries, if they trade with one another, there is no problem of exchange rate fluctuation because it's one currency, right? But if there is high volatility between pound and euro, okay, one party will gain, the other will lose because of appreciation or depreciation of currency. Do you understand? So therefore, not to have such problems, they make it fixed. Fixed exchange rate. One dollar is equal for a one uh, pound is equal to one point two euro, let's say. Not change. Just for the sake of avoid fluctuations in trade. Okay? Good. I think regarding when it's clear, and the last level of economic integration is economic union. Economic union. So look, now again, if you consider that economic union, so here the best example of economic union is Soviet Union. Okay? It's the perfect example. And last perfect example is US. Why? Soviet Union it consisted of 15 member countries, right? including our country. So, did we have any tariff between those countries? No tariffs, yes? Our external tariffs with all other countries was exactly identical, same. And then, based on that one, we had labor mobility and plus capital mobility, okay? And plus our monetary policy and fiscal policy was identical. Okay. Common market, EU, not economic union. Each country they have different monetary policies and fiscal policies. In economic union it must be the same too. Plus these countries should have single currency. During Soviet Union it was ruble. Okay? Ruble. Why I'm saying it's less Okay, you got the United States. Labor mobility is perfect. Capital mobility is perfect. Okay, but based on their fiscal policies and monetary policies, state by state, there are some differences. 
Okay? So they have different policies based on their states. So they thought it is less perfect economic union. But today we can consider only US as economic union. Okay? Good. So it is economic union, so step by step. So here reducing tariffs, removing tariffs, then making external tariffs same, allowing for capital mobility and labor mobility, and the last one, making our policy set. This is last level of economic integration. Okay? I see it's clear for all of you. So now if you look at the data, actual data, the data is a bit old 2000 data, it's the data that I was able to find only. If you look, EU countries, which means the yellow country indicates expert of those countries within the members, which means they are exporting more than 60% of their expert merchandise within their members. And they import 60% within their members, which means they are really strongly supporting their member countries. Very good. Regarding that, the North American free trade area, now you can see the share of expert in the in, expert is a, a bit higher. I will explain why, okay? While still they are importing more than 40%. Okay? And here, another advantage of establishing this kind of common markets. For example, you can see the European Union, right? Very big market, okay? So which means all countries in the world, they would like to, to trade with those countries. So once they establish common market, right? 27 countries, 27 countries, they can produce you know, millions of types of goods and services. If Germans need one type of good, most probably they are able to find one of them, okay? With no tariffs. While there are many other countries who, are a, who want to supply, okay, and to export, but they are unable to because of high tariffs, okay? So therefore, if U.S. wants to trade here, what should they do? They should invest here. Okay? And we know, and we will talk about that investment uh, topic later, okay? So why one reason Europe became so strong because of investment flow too. Americans were investing billions of dollars, okay, to European market, not because they really want to do it. It's because they want to gain their market share, okay? If they don't do it, they will lose their market share. Because there are some other producers here, they can sell without any tariffs. Okay? Good. And if you look at uh, this data regarding NAFTA, you can see that United States exports to its member, member country, Canada only 16.1%, to Mexico 12.9%. While Canada exports to the US more than 60% of its merchandise. And Mexico too, more than 60%. Which means Canada and Mexico's economy based on trading becomes so strong because of the US. Okay? And you can see if they you know that if they cancel that trade agreement, which the Donald Trump is saying one of the most disastrous uh, agreements that was signed in the history of US, NAFTA, okay, if it comes to end, then it means these two countries will lose their market share in the US. Okay, good. So now we will talk about trade creation and trade diversion, which is super important, okay, and very puzzling also. All right, very puzzling. Now I will explain it theoretically, and during the seminar we will do some exercises too. Please be careful. It is important. Regarding the exercise that I'm going to explain it to you now, I can provide you with an answer, okay, which is given already in the book. But it's a bit puzzling to understand. So now we will consider who's back market, okay? 
supply and demand. Let's say for cars, okay? Cars. Demand and supply. Okay. Uzbekistan's market. This is the supply of Uzbekistan. This is the demand curve of Uzbekistan. Good. First, we consider trade creation effect. What is trade creation? Trade creation, it means now Uzbekistan is going to substitute, okay, its domestically produced some you know, goods with lower cost from member country. From member country. Sorry, because of the noise. I also see that it still has a bit touch. So let's suppose this is the supply curve, okay, of Russian car. They are able to supply their car for one hundred dollars, all right. And because Uzbekistan, they wanted to protect our GM cars, we were imposing one hundred percent tariff on Russian cars, okay. Russian car plus ten. So it made the price two hundred dollars, right? Okay. So now this is the case. For example, between Uzbekistan and Russia, there is tariff between the countries. Hundred percent tariff. So now. After many years of this, you know, this type of trade, okay, this type of trade, you can see that Uzbekistan's market share at this point is this much, yes? So with 200, uh, $200 of price, let's say we are able to produce 100 cars. And the rest is imported from? Russia, let's suppose, which is 150. 50 cars are imported from Russia. So now, Uzbekistan and Russia, they agreed to establish customs union. What's the rule of customs union? Zero tariffs. Zero tariffs, yes? Zero tariffs, okay. So now, which means, Russian cars, Russia, they are able to supply for 100 cars, 100 dollars, right? So which means the price of cars will go down to 100. As a result, our market share will be reduced from 100 to 50, yes? While Russian market share will increase from, from only 50 to, let's say 200. Okay? 150. We call it trade creation. Why? Because we signed customs union agreement with Russia, which became our member, we replaced, we replaced our non-efficient production with efficient Russian production. Because Russians are able to produce same cars with lower cost. So now we replace it. Uzbekistan's, because it's Uzbekistan's share, yes? Uzbekistan's non efficient production is replaced by Russian efficient production. So this triangle is called as trade creation area. Another one. We call this part also as trade creation. Why? The prices are cheaper, now people are trading more. They are buying more. Do you understand? So this, these are the static gains from establishing customs union and it is called trade creation. Do you understand? Okay. So now if you understood that trade, trade creation, okay, where we already saw it. And what about this question? What is the effect of trade creation on member and non-member countries? If 
you load here? How would GM be disadvantaged, right? Before signing the custom union, we were producing 100. But now we are producing 50. Which means Russians are selling more. Which means they are benefiting more. Are we losing? Here, you may think that, yes, based on this model, it seems that we are losing. But Uzbekistan's economy is not only based on car production. We have so many other industries, OK? Exactly the same phenomena can be applied for in terms of factor. Let's say Russian they were imposing 200 you know, dollars, 100 percent tariff on our cotton after customs union where they reduce and now our market share in Russia get, get much bigger. Do you understand? As a whole, trade creation usually gets bigger. Benefit, both sides. What about the non-members? Let's suppose if we consider this case, now it means people are buying cars after this agreement for cheaper, right? They used to buy for 200, now they are buying for 100 to big people. Let's say you were saving $200, okay, to buy a car. The next day we signed a customs union, it turned out that the price went down 100, you spent 100, the rest left in your pocket. Which means you can spend to go to Turkey, or to go to Egypt, or to the US, just to travel. Which means there, Tourism industry will get a benefit. Or you can spend for that money for some other goods too, for no problem. Non-members also benefit. Do you understand? Because we are, we got richer. Good. And there is trade diversion case, okay, it's a bit puzzling as well. Now I will root, I will use the same uh, you know graph here. What is trade diversion? For example, we were buying from, uh, from some countries, right? Non-member countries. Because we signed trade agreement, okay, trade agreement or the integration with another country, in, in terms of some goods, we replace efficient non-member production with non-efficient member production. For example, we will consider the case of aluminium. Aluminium, okay. For example, there are Tajikistanis, okay, sorry, Tajikistanis, who are able to supply their aluminium for $100. All right? And then we have another supplier from Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, who are able to supply it for $150. Let's say because our you know aluminium production is very low in Uzbekistan, we don't charge any tariff on aluminium. So and then in this case there is no tariff. From which country are we going to buy? From Tajikistan, because the cheapest price. If it was not available, we could buy from Kazakhstan. Let's say we are buying from Tajikistan, which means this is our margin that we are producing. The rest is supplied from Tajikistan. Okay? Good. So now let's suppose after after a few years, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan signed customs union. What are the rules? Between these countries, there is no tariff, but the external tariff is same. Let's suppose in this case, because Kazakhstan they also produce aluminium, they were imposing 100% tariff on any aluminium imported to Kazakhstan. So which means, let's suppose because it's, you know, on that one, Uzbekistan agreed to make their tariffs on aluminium 100% too. Do you understand? Because they signed, it, it must be. Right? So which means 
Now, if Uzbekistan is want to buy Tajikistani aluminium, it will cost them $200. But at this price, we know there is Kazakhstan. Yes, Kazakhstan. Where we can buy? Because it's our member, there is no barrier for Kazakhstan. So now we change our trade from Tajikistan to Kazakhstan. So which means that now trade diversion happens. Because we are buying from our member, which is non compared to Tajikistan, they are non-efficient. We are changing with efficient Tajikistan products. As a result, what happened? Our market share increased, yes. Now, in Uzbekistan, we are producing more because price increased, which means we are able to produce a bit more supply. Good? But this triangle is called trade diversion. Why? Because this is we are producing, right? We are producing. Tajikistani efficient production is replaced by non-efficient Uzbek production. Okay? And now you can see here, this part is also called as trade diversion. Why? Now people are paying $50 more. Why? Because we signed customs union. It is inefficiency caused by signing customs union agreement. Okay? Another. This one is also called as that way loss. Why? Because of price increase, our people are not able to buy this quantity of aluminium. Do you understand? So we think this entire area is considered as welfare loss. It is loss. Because we replace efficient Tajik production with non-efficient Kazakh production. Good. This is the third case, okay, which I explained. Good. And there is second case. Let's suppose we, we made an assumption that there was no tariff, right? But now you should make an assumption that there is tariff. Uzbekistan imposes 100% tariff on both Tajikistani and Kazakhstani aluminiums. If you want to buy Tajikistani aluminium, we have to pay $200. If you want to buy from Kazakhstan, we have to pay $300. Yes? Okay. So now in this case, again, it was like this. There was tariff. Uzbekistan signed customs union agreement with Kazakhstan. Which means we were buying for 200. Now there is no Kazakh aluminium is not imposed to tariff. The price will go down to $150. Yes? Are we going to buy from Tajikistan or Kazakhstan? Of course, from Kazakhstan. What will happen as a result? So now So now we are buying for one hundred dollars, yes. So this area, this area, okay, is called as trade creation. Why? This area we were producing, right? Because the price was very high. So now Uzbekistan's non-efficient production is replaced by Kazakhstan efficient production one. Because of price decrease, people's consumer surplus increase. Right? But now there is this area which we call as loss. Why? Before signing customs union, before customs union, we were buying from Tajikistan for $200, yes? Which means this part we, are, we were getting as tariff revenue to the government. 
terror revenue to the government. After signing customs union with Kazakhstan, things became cheaper, which means this area is not lost. Why? Because people are paying cheap paying less. But this part is lost because Kazakhstan does not pay tariff. Before customs union, you know, countries they were pay, paying tariffs. We were okay. So as a result, what will happen? It is nothing lost. So here now, there are two trade creations and one trade diversion. So if we calculate the surface of these shapes, and if we find that trade creation is greater than trade diversion, it means it's good. If it's negative, then it is negative. Okay? Do you understand? Okay. So don't worry, during the seminar we will have many things to talk more. Okay? Good. So this is the case with this case, second. So because customs union is practicing in, 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 in uh, today's life, okay? When customs union is going to be more and more beneficial, okay? Number one condition is those countries who are going to establish customs union, okay? Those countries, you with Pakistan and Kazakhstan, they are very high tariffs between each other, which means they try to strongly protect from Kazakhstan. Because if we trade with them, they have certain goods that they can harm our industry. So which means they have comparative advantage. So once we establish customs union, so then it will give very good opportunity to practice comparative advantages between the countries. The lower are the customs union barriers on trade with the rest of the world. What does it mean? It means if barriers are lower with other countries, not members, that trade diversion case will be very low. Okay, very low. So now our time is limited. So now I will show you way to read this. Okay, it's going to be your homework. Okay, we have to read this. Why? How custom units can be more beneficial? It's because of these reasons. During the seminar, I will ask the following: these three slides. Okay, this is another benefit. Okay, that for example, the first one is very easy. When European Union, 27 countries, they sign customs union, a common market, they immediately they remove their customs you know, officers from borders. No need. Government, they don't have to pay extra. Okay? And those border patrols. Okay? And these are dynamic benefits. These ones, I will ask these questions too. All right? And I strongly recommend you to read these books. Okay? And the homework that I gave you, it's available from Salvador. Okay? You can read it. It's not many pages, maybe five, actually. Yeah, we are done. Thank you very much.